That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Because we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood Company. All right, people, we know the shadowy elite have dedicated many pages in their playbook to suppressing information, technology, and scientific advancements that could improve the lives of the people and help us better understand reality. But those of us who are paying attention have recognized the scientific quarantine and seen many indications of the big suppression along the way. The work of Nikola Tesla, denial of electrogravitic crafts, lost legends of alchemy, the lies of NASA, whispers of a breakaway civilization, and the free energy cancer cure technologies we've heard exist but have been thoroughly kiboshed for our own good. We know there's hidden truths in these areas and that mainstream science is incomplete. And here to help us piece the puzzle back together is an independent researcher known only as the Shaman Engineer. For over a decade, he's worked in a variety of industries on robotics, manufacturing equipment, chemical systems, and alternative energy, and he knows firsthand that we're being held back in more ways than one. After a few interesting posts on the Plus forums, he contacted me directly through the THC Plus messaging system with a ton of titillating research and information that I think will make an excellent show. I know I've had my mind blown more than a few times already, and I can't wait to get back into this stuff. And his first real interview coming out of the shadows and onto the main stage, Shaman Janir, my man, welcome to the higher side. Thank you very much, Greg. That's a great intro as always. <laughs> I try, man. It's one of the few jobs a host has that they should actually put some energy into. But this uh, is exciting, man. People have requested many times that maybe I have a listener or a member from the forums on as a guest, and I've been pretty resistant to it. But you hit me with some super fascinating stuff and have connected a lot of dots between previous guests and topics that have really been some of my favorite. And a lot of this revolves around ether. I guess this idea that many bright minds used to include in their model of the universe, but mainstream science has taken out most likely because of its huge uh, potential. And we're now given a model of space as an empty void, literally nothing to see here, people. And I guess this ties into a lot of other areas, but lay us a base here. What is being proposed in this dynamic ether theory? Well, I should just start with what ether is just in itself. Sure. I mean, it, people say, oh, I pull stuff out of the ether. You've said that on your show several times. <laughs> yeah, guilty. And so it, it's in the nomenclature. People say it, but they don't really understand what it means. So there's kind of a nebulous understanding of it as this other space or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the understanding doesn't really go much beyond that. Sometimes people will delve into the actual scientific background of it, but not very deep because we're always told that general relativity, just put the kibosh on that. It's all done with. You don't need to worry about either. Just worry about relativity. Mm -hmm. And space-time is a good analogy to the ether, actually, because that is the modern ether. It's what we use in our conception for a way for light to bend and things like that, which is actually covered in the ether theory. Mm -hmm. So ether is the medium of light. In the ether model, it composes matter, and it gives rise to gravity. So gravity in the ether model is essentially a flow of ether. If you imagine kind of a fluid flowing past you and holding you down to the earth, that's an analogy, but it's kind of a spatial fluid. Okay. So this is just broad strokes. What might ether be conceived of? That's ether with an E. There's also what's discussed a ether the a e -ther version of that word right and it's more the undifferentiated ether it's the ether that is more an informational ether the thought space there's actually this relationship between the two ethers where one gives rise to the other the undifferentiated ether gives rise to the differentiated ether that relationship can account for the transition from material to energy to information. Okay. And these are the main levels 
of how modeling occurs in any science. So you have to take account of matter, energy, and information, and how those all transpose. There's, there's actually something called Maxwell's demon, which is the concept of being able to make an information change and having that give rise to energy. Hmm. And so Maxwell's demon is what prevents you from doing that. But there was a recent experiment a few years ago where they, they actually claimed to have quantumly bypassed Maxwell's demon. So there's implications right there for things like free energy and stuff like that. And also that would fit with the ether model being able to do something like that because that would include a larger informational space beyond our stated reality, our observable reality. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a base conception of, of how all this relates to everything from what you can touch to what you can think. Mm -hmm. Right on. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely dense stuff. And, you know, as you mentioned in our conversation, I've had a lot of guests who allude to a secret science and an incomplete puzzle, but a lot of the dots have kind of yet to really connect. And this is the answer as you see it, right? Yeah. Once I start to get into the history, and I'm going to get to that later, but you'll see that ether theory is really what has given rise to those technologies. And it didn't start in, you know, the 1940s after World War II. It started much earlier than that, and it has roots going all the way into the Renaissance hmm. and the Crusades. It's something that, you know, once you start to get into the understanding of alchemy and how that fits into the ether model, then all that will start to make a bit more sense. Right on. So, you know, if we call the air or the, the atmosphere or whatever we call it, ether, well, no, it, it, that that's not really correct. So air is a, an atomic structure. It, it's a molecular structure, actually. Okay, yeah. It's all these different atoms and molecules. But the ether is like the fluid of space. It's the electric fluid, as Faraday called it. Okay. So, sure, yeah. I Obviously, I'm. this is fairly new to me in terms of the actual nomenclature and terms. But why should... You know, why should a listener care? What are the implications of this understanding of the environment kind of as opposed to the traditional one? Basically, the current scientific model is extremely materialistic. It's it's based on observations that are very strictly defined in terms of being able to be explained in, in a rational way with material models. Everything boils down to particles. Even dark matter, that's something we can't observe, but yet, oh, well, it must be matter, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to get into maybe some of the best scientific evidence for the ether model? Sure. So I'll go ahead and start with a, a few quotes from Tesla and Einstein, because at the time of, of Einstein proposing relativity, Tesla was one of the main objectors to his model. And so you'll, you'll see a bit of his own idea of, of what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. That's what Nikola Tesla said. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to give some quotes from Albert Einstein on the ether. Because most people don't realize this, but relativity requires an ether. And, and Albert Einstein actually said that. And these quotes will illustrate that. The special theory of relativity does not compel us to deny ether. We may assume the existence of an ether, only we must give up ascribing a definite motion to it, i.e. we must take by extraction from it the last mechanical characteristic which Lorenz had still left it. So what he's saying there is that I'm using an ether model, but this ether can't move. So that's where we get the idea of curvature from. Mm -hmm. Space-time curvature and all that. Gravitational lensing, bending light around objects and things like that. It comes from this idea that you can't have things moving in terms of space-time, really. Mm -hmm. 
And then here's another quote from Albert Einstein. It would be a great advance if we could succeed in comprehending the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field together as one unified confirmation. Then for the first time in the epoch of theoretical physics founded by Faraday and Maxwell, we would reach a satisfactory conclusion. The contrast between ether and matter would fade away. So even Einstein recognizes that ether and matter are related and that there's a kind of a transmutation going on between there. That's what I think what he was talking about in his E equals MC squared equation. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I love getting the context for those old quotes because it seems like our modern interpretation has gotten way away from even what the guys were saying at the time. And uh, it's just kind of weird how we leave out some of even their questions about, you know, what remains. But uh, I guess another part of this we should talk about is what is ether drift? So I'll start real quickly with what kind of gave rise to the model of the ether that the ether drift experiments were trying to look at. Sure. If you think about sound traveling in air or water, the denser the medium, the the better the transmission. So it'll be louder, better attenuation. You know, you'll pick up more. And you hear that with whale songs versus bird songs. Mm -hmm. If you walk away from a bird singing, it'll drop off pretty quickly. If you're underwater, it's much denser. And the whale's song will carry for miles. But when they were looking at light, when they're first looking at the properties of light, they basically realized, okay, this is traveling so fast, it must be an incredibly dense medium. And it's kind of a little bit elastic, so it can allow these waves to pass through. They, they understood the interference of the waves and things like that. So they understood that they were working with wave action. And so that's basically where the model of the luminiferous ether comes from. Now, Michelson-Morley experiment was set up to test the luminiferous ether model. So basically what they did was they made a large granite platform, I believe, or maybe it was sandstone. It was heavy and it was very stable. And then they built a cross array on it that had mirrors and lights. And they would look and they would see if there was a drift in this little fringe pattern that would be set up where they were supposed to look. And by observing the drift in the fringes, they could tell if there was an etheric motion being entrained by the Earth as it moved through space. So if you think about just plumping a ball through water or something like that, you're going to have this boundary layer that gets built up around it where there's less drift towards the surface. But if you're able to to measure it, you can get a, uh, a good idea of kind of the properties. Mm -hmm. But the thing was that the Michelson-Morley experiment was an extremely deficient experiment. It only had 36 data points, which is barely statistically significant. So when you're doing statistical analysis, you want at least 30 data points to have any real statistical significance. And if you're making a fundamental observation of reality, I mean, how many decimal places do they take out gravity or, you know, some of these other constants, too? And these guys were only using 36 data points. You can't really make big determinations from that. So today, if you go to Wikipedia, you look up the Michelson-Morley experiment, they'll say it was a null result. Right. But if you actually go and look at the paper, which I sent you, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> then there's more to it than that. That you actually see this small little sinusoidal wave in the raw data. They show it there. And in their supplement to the experiment, they actually say it is obvious from what has gone before, referencing the main body of the paper, that it would be hopeless to attempt to solve the question of the motion of the solar system by observations of optical phenomena at the surface of the Earth. Now, you got to realize their experiment was conducted in a basement at sea level. So they were right at the surface of the Earth, mm -hmm. which would be the worst place to measure it, actually. But it is not impossible that at even moderate distances above the level of the sea, at the top of an isolated mountain peak, for instance, the relative motion might be perceptible in an apparatus like that used in these experiments. 
perhaps if the experiment should ever be tried in these circumstances, the cover should be glass or should be removed. So they're recognizing that there could be interference from large masses. Hmm. One more thing before I give up on Michelson and Morley. Uh, we should note that Michelson, of the Michelson Morley experiment, believed in ether based physics until the day he died. Hmm. To understand the basic differences in the different types of ether now, I'm going to start to go into that. Okay. So there's the luminiferous ether, and that's the one that we started to get into a little bit. And the way I, I really conceive of it is kind of like a cosmic block of granite that's kind of rubbery. I mean, it's very dense, but it's kind of rubbery mm -hmm. because it's able to transmit these waves. I'm just giving you the context for that experiment. Gotcha. Okay. So that you can understand what they actually proved in the experiment. Right. Now, I, I talked about what they actually said about it. They said that they couldn't really make a determination. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go into what is implied by their experiment and then get into uh, the further experiments of Dayton Miller, where he actually did follow their recommendations and go up to the top of the mountain and take off the covers of the apparatus. Mm -hmm. So what they were looking for was the luminiferous ether. Their experimental rig was set up for that, and it would have shown something if it was there. The way I would explain it is it's, it's kind of like you're looking for hail, and you put out a bucket. It's just foggy. And you're like, there's no moisture here. <laughs> you know, kind of gotcha, a thing. Gotcha, so gotcha. It wasn't set up properly to detect what's actually there, in my opinion. Okay. So the luminiferous ether. Think of a cosmic block of granite representing space. It was a rigid transducer of electromagnetic waves. While the motion of a rigid ether was disproved by Michelson Morley, it did not disprove the motion of a dynamic ether. A dynamic ether is an ether that's capable of transitioning into other states of arrangement. Mm -hmm. So it would have differing properties depending on the excitations that it was experiencing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to explain the difference between the luminiferous ether and the relativistic ether. So the relativistic ether is the ether that Albert Einstein was talking about when he was talking about the ether in his quote. Now, the fabric of space-time that current scientific thinking espouses, and it's really, rather than a fabric, it's more of a gelatin, because it's fills three-dimensional space, it can curve and it can, it can, you know, twist and things like that, but it doesn't have real motion to it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, like I said before, that's where the concept of gravitational lensing comes from is curvature. So now the dynamic ether is where space can flow and it's the medium of electromagnetic and gravitational transmission. It's based on the rate of frequency of conduction for electrical signals, and the ether is a compressible fluid like a gas, but it can act like a liquid or a solid, and possibly even a plasma. I'm not sure, but this is kind of the range of states that we kind of see in our material world seem to be the sort of states that can appear in this etheric world. Mm -hmm. And there's also also the possibility that when the ancients were talking about the elements, they weren't really talking about the actual elements that they thought comprised an atom of any given material. It may have been the states that were involved in the etheric you know, configuration of that material or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Because I think that a lot of ancient people we're dealing with this stuff on a more intuitive level because that's how it expresses itself when it is expressed mm -hmm. in people's minds. So I think that there is some truth to those conceptions, but they aren't in the material realm specifically. They're kind of domains of the etheric, if you think about it that way. Sure. Different ways for this etheric energy to behave depending on the conditions. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So um, I'm going to talk about Dayton Miller now. He followed up on the Michelson and Morley experiments, and he basically built a house, a wooden house, at the top of Mount Wilson to house the experimental apparatus. It, it was on a large block of stone. He had a few different configurations. I think there was a brass one. There was a steel one. There was another one that uh, it, it had different panels. There was like panels of cork and panels of glass. And he kind of saw how the different effects would work on the apparatus if it was heated. He had parabolic heaters he set up all around it to see if heating effects would affect it. And basically what he did was he repeated the experiments of Michelson and Morley, seeing if there's this entrainment of the ether around the Earth. And he was able to detect it. And he was able to detect its direction. He was able to detect its speed. And at the time, Albert Einstein, he actually recognized that if Miller's experiments held up, it would invalidate his theory of relativity. And this is his quote on the subject. He said, my opinion about Miller's experiments is the following. Should the re positive result be confirmed, then the special theory of relativity and with it the general theory of relativity in its current form would be invalid. Experimentum summus judex. Only the equivalence of inertia and gravitation would remain. However, they would lead to a significantly different theory. And that's Albert Einstein in a letter to Edwin E. Slauson on the 8th of July, 1925. And it's from the Hebrew University Archive in Jerusalem. <laughs> so <laughs> Pretty conclusive, man. I like that. Now, at the time, and even today, those results of Dayton Miller's are dismissed. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. At the time, they said, well, it's heating effects from the sun. Now, never mind that this wooden house that he had it in, he basically had it set up like a tent over the house. There are all these streaming, like, linen cloths that he'd hang from the house to help block the sun and distribute the heat away from the house. And he, like I said, he corrected for heating with parabolic heaters. And also, the fluctuations did not correlate with the heating cycles of the sun. So, the, I mean, the argument falls apart right there. Today, there's currently a paper that's floating out there on the internet that I saw where they're basically claiming, well, maybe the heating effects weren't really that, you know, something that, that was really that effect. But we're going to just look at it from the statistical standpoint. And they go down that road. And I didn't see anything really conclusive from them in terms of why it was being rejected. Their, their basic argument boiled down to, well, We've got computers nowadays, so that's why their statistical analysis wasn't correct. And it's like, wait, that has nothing to do with statistical analysis. Just because it was done by hand doesn't mean it was done incorrectly. They had an independent analysis done. <laughs> the mathematics of statistics have not changed in that period of time since the 1920s to where it would fall apart. I mean, there, there would be dozens of other things from before. Mm -hmm. So we developed Maxwell's equations with no statistical analysis that was valid. I mean, come on. Right. Well, they, they always got to have an official answer. You know, weather balloons and swamp gas, they got to come up with some way to dismiss stuff. Yeah, it's, it's smoke and mirrors from what I can tell that paper. So <laughs> Interesting, man. I mean, that's a pretty good background and context for, you know, the validity of this ether theory. Obviously, a big part of what we talk about on the show is that our traditional paradigm has problems and leaves a lot of questions unanswered. How does this model affect the way we should think about space and our environment in a practical way? Well, you, you asked me before about how this relates to the electric universe and stuff like that. And all the things that, you know, Wall Thornhill and I think it's Donald G. Scott Basically, what they're looking at as inspiration is plasma physics. And plasma physics fits perfectly with the ether model. Tesla was working with plasmas all day long. He, he first came up with the use of plasma for medical uh, sterilization. Plasma is, <laughs> is right, up, right up ether physics alley. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever backstory they put on it, if they have their own theories based on materialist science, then that's what they're putting forward. But I, I would contend that the ether model can explain it better. Mm -hmm. While Thornhill talks about the pinch effect, the pinch effect is essentially where there's counter rotational 
plasma vortices that are coming together and they're creating gravitation or gravitational waves. And that's precisely what I talked about in my discussion with you about the ether model. Mm -hmm. On the interior of the sun, there is a pinch effect in the center. And that's what he was describing. But that's exactly what is modeled from the ether model. Mm. And it also models there being uh, an internal sun in the center of the Earth. Right. So I'm going to start to get into that now. Basically, the sun is a receiver and a transmitter of longitudinal energy. So longitudinal or scalar energy, basically the, the best way to think about it is like a twizzler in the air. It's this long, twisted thread. Okay. Actually, that's what the Kogi Indians call it, is a thread. Hmm. They live in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia. And there's actually a documentary called The Luna where they follow these guys around. They, they actually have a golden thread made. And they walk it along the beach in Colombia as, as a symbolic act. And they go for like hundreds of miles just walking, carrying this thread, dragging it behind them. Because what they wanted to do was raise awareness of the effect that people's actions have through longitudinal fields, telluric currents, the, the world energy grid. And demonstrate to them that what they do down in the valley affects how the animals live up in the mountains where they are. Mm -hmm. And they're tired of everybody crapping down there. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, they're over building, they're, they're sealing off the surfaces. You know, all the water just gets drained off into the ocean. And so they're saying, you know, you're hurting our rainfall. Mm -hmm. And they're also digging up golden idols that they've buried that are meant to be there for ceremonial purposes, but they also tie into the telluric energy. It's affecting the the way the plants are growing because the telluric energy is being disrupted because people are digging up those idols to sell them for gold. Mm -hmm. These are all things that come up in this documentary. Basically, these currents in the um, electric universe model, these give rise to Birkeland currents, which are something that's described heavily in that model. They, they, they talk about it how it distributes hundreds and thousands of amps, you know, millions of volts mm -hmm. going going through the universe, just <laughs> everywhere. They're just streaming all over the place. And they're like, yeah, yeah, here they are. They're all over the place. They're, they're distributing energy throughout the universe. And, <laughs> you know, and that's exactly what's predicted by an ether physics model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let, let's get a little bit into Maxwell's equation. Sure. So Maxwell's equations, when they were originally written, they were written in a, in a type of algebra that specifically had a it had a tensor component or a vector. It's basically it's a direction with a magnitude, and then it had a scalar component, which was a magnitude. But what it really is in space is a vortex. Okay. The, the scalar is a vortex. It, it's where all of the arrows. Once it comes back the other side around of the vortex, it's pointing in the opposite direction with the same magnitude. So they all cancel out mathematically, but there's still a vortex there. <laughs> this was accounted for in, in Maxwell's original equations. But by the time it got to, you know, I think it was Heaviside went through it and, and he modified it and Hertz came in and he modified it a bit. And so by the time it gets to the point where it's quote unquote usable, then that's been taken out. Mm -hmm. And so there are very few people, Tesla being one of them, who understood that that still had a major effect and that that was something to look into. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So how does this relate to the, the idea of the inner sun or the hollow earth itself? I'll start just kind of with formation of suns and planets and things like that, maybe. So, so basically, what we call black holes aren't really black holes. Mm -hmm. They don't have a boundary layer. They're basically a mathematical artifact of dividing by zero. You know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and everybody's like, oh, oh, it was from infinite mass. <laughs> It'll suck everything into it. But no. Um, Really, it's an implosive structure. The math doesn't work out to, to have it described the way that they, they want it to be described. 
But basically, whenever you have these implosive structures, and there's an implosive structure at the center of the sun, there's an implosive structure at the center of the moon, there's an implosive structure at the center of the earth, it's all depending on these flows of plasma and how, how they twist against each other, kind of like the Nazi bell where there are these twisting, counter-rotating uh, mercury plasmas that are being pulsed with electricity. It's, it's sim- similar in concept to that, and that's why all, all hell breaks loose around that damn thing. You know, people melting into gray gobs of goo and it lifting off and, you know, breaking from its moors and all sorts of stuff like that. <laughs> so basically the way that this stuff forms is that there are these implosive, the, these majorly implosive uh, structures that we call black holes, but they're really, I don't know what to call them, implosive structures. Mm-hmm. They're basically these big vortices that come together and then they they spray out these particles, but in there are also these longitudinal fields and they start to carry energy with them and they, they start to spin depending on the motion of, of the surrounding universe. They start to form these conglomerations of matter and these matter, these conglomerations of matter are spinning. And if you have, uh, a conglomeration of matter that's spinning, then it won't be a ball. If it's big enough and it's spinning fast enough, it's going to be hollow because it's going to all come to the outside. Mm-hmm. Think about a centrifuge. What happens? All Everything gets forced to the outside. Right. I, I thought about that ride that is at a lot of amusement parks where you line up along the outside wall. And then as it spins, you can lift your legs up and feet up. And the whole game is like trying to pull your hand off the wall and it sticks back to it. Exactly. So if you have a large enough energy of rotation, basically, then you're going to have a cavity structure form in there. And if a cavity structure forms and everything starts to get stabilized, I mean, the first there'd be the formation of the sun. The sun would find its place and then it'd start to form these belts of planetary you know debris that would rotate into masses and things like that and it, it all conforms to a harmonic relationship it's actually called the Bode points mm-hmm. because uh, there was this guy named Bode who calculated that these are these planets aren't just spaced out randomly they're according to like resonant relationships between the size of the planets and how far away they are and the size of the sun and all this stuff. Basically, at these points is where these things start to form and they develop this cavity, but they're also being fed this energy from the sun, which is being fed this energy from nearby black holes, so to speak. And the reason is because once you get into this this pinch, as Wal Thornhill calls it, or this counter-rotational plasma arrangement then you you have the perfect condition for there to be a vacuum of of immense immense proportions created inside of there and that is what actually is powering everything it's this vacuum energy the zero point energy that's actually coming out in that arrangement and so that that is primarily coming out of these large these large black hole structures and then that feeds into the suns, which develop their own little implosive center inside of them. And that in turn feeds the planets. And so it, it's all kind of a, a, a distribution network, if you will. Okay. That's what Wal Thornhill was describing when he was describing these Birkeland currents mm-hmm. of, you know, these plasmas. These, these plasmas are essentially an indicator of these longitudinal fields, I think. Because if, once you get the longitudinal field there, then yeah, all this other stuff's going to carry along, carry it along with it. But without that, it wouldn't it wouldn't form there at the beginning. Of right on, man. I mean, it's a lot. It definitely is some high level stuff. I didn't learn this in school, but you also talked about the possibility that the Earth is expanding. Yes, yes. Well, it, it, that's what all the, all this energy is going to. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're getting this feed from the, the emissions of the black holes. You're going into the sun. The sun's re-emitting it, giving a little bit of boost of its own, comes into the earth, and that goes into its own little sun in the center there. That is feeding the growth of the earth. 
So there's this constant expansion. And, and if you look at the, if you look at the ocean floor maps from NOAA, NOAA, the uh, National Oceanic and what is it, uh, Atmospheric uh, Association or something. Yeah, like that. something like that. They actually have a map of the ocean floor and, and you'll see that they're the kind of these little bursts of growth. And basically the, all the continents are about two billion years old. You know, everybody, everybody looked at the, at the, you know, at the globe when they were a kid and they're like, well, that kind of looks like it fits together. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you're right. It does. Everybody knows it intuitively. Yeah. It fits together. So basically, as the earth was forming, it had this cavity inside and it didn't initially have a sun. It was kind of this small little rock kind of floating around following the sun. But at some point, you know, cause it kept accumulating and accumulating more matter and there was still energy streaming into it from the sun. It's kind of like when you have a nuclear reactor, you know, if it, if you get enough energy flowing into it and it's all getting concentrated boom it kind of kicks off yeah so that's that's what happened there around 65 million years ago is when it kind of kicked off but there were little little blips before that you see on the map but at at that point it just starts going bonkers like you'll see huge expansions then it'll kind of chill out for a bit and then you'll see huge expansions and then it'll stop and you you see the these different areas where on the seafloor like it's 65 million years old. It's like 25 million years old. And then it's getting closer to, to our age. And, and the closer it gets, the bigger it gets. So it looks like, you know, these expansive spurts of the earth from this, this longitudinal and plasmic and electric and, you know, all this energy coming in, streaming out of the, out of the sun and out of the, out of these uh, black holes is causing the earth to in periodic times to grow and grow dramatically. That kind of aligns with a lot of ancient thoughts. And it looks like it's been about four times. So kind of like, hey, well, we're in the fourth world or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there might be some tie in there. Who knows? Yeah. But I'm not really saying that there were people around 65 million years ago. But who knows who might have told them that that happened? <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. But this distribution network, it is a little odd that so much of it, meaning the other planets, were told appear to be largely useless, just big dead rocks or balls of gas. It's weird to think the distribution network would churn out all this extra stuff and then this one small planet that all the life is on somewhere in the middle. Doesn't seem that efficient, really. Well, um, I can talk about Wilhelm Reich. Oh, sure. Orgon and the Cloudbuster gun. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Wilhelm Reich, he was a student of Sigmund Freud, and he went into studying Freud's libido. And he wanted to see if there was a way to, you know, measure sexual energy scientifically. And so what he did was he hooked up a galvanometer to people and he started to do some experiments. And he basically realized there's a real energy here. There's something here. And it's showing up in these galvanometer um, experiments. And he was just measuring people's surface conductivity of their skin. And, and he realized it was a pulsating energy. And what we're talking about is a kind of pulsating energy. Mm-hmm. And so basically, as he went into that, when he started to get into his bion experiments is where it kind of gets into life on other worlds and things like that. What he did was he took things like grass clippings and he would heat it up to incandescence and then, you know, put it in boiled water in under sterile conditions. And then he would just let it kind of stew for a while Mm -hmm. and see what happened. And lo and behold, he started watching it and all these little particles in there would start to, kind of form these little balls and then they would start to glow and pulsate and before long he was able to actually grow these little amoebas and stuff like that from carbons carbon and (laughs) and you know other like silicas and yeah nothing too exotic there but he was able to do it and there's actually a um a book 
recently written by, I think it was a Stanford University researcher. It's called Wilhelm Reich Biologist. And he actually went through and looked at all Wilhelm Reich's laboratory notebooks. And his contention in that book is basically, yes, I, I went through all his laboratory notebooks. He did the right thing. He, he wasn't full of shit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> so, I mean, is, is that is the implication that that process is going on on other planets, even though their environments are extremely different? It brings up the, the idea of autogenesis. This idea that life, it's not a one-off thing. It's not something that's, oh, you got to get the conditions just right and all this. It was just kind of like, whoa, let me, let me burn the hell out of this. And then I'll, I'll slap it in some water here and just kind of let it sit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that happens every single day? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like uh, Alan Watts. He says that the earth peoples the way an apple tree apples. It just makes people. Yeah. I think anywhere life can exist, it just pops into existence. <laughs> That's what I think. The old Jeff Goldblum quote, life finds a way. Yeah. Well, it it doesn't look like it, easy, it really has to try that hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, man. So let's get into the history a little bit. Time is obviously flying by and we're not going to get to everything we had wanted to get to, I don't think, because we're at pretty much the halfway point. Um, oh. <laughs> but, let, but let's get into the history a little bit. This You say this goes back to the Renaissance, at least the knowledge of this, the study of this in some degree. Yeah, I was talking more about the, uh, the alchemical roots and things like that, getting into, uh, I mean, that gets into the whole Ormus ball of wax, if you want to delve into that absolutely um what i would say about that is man of all the things you shared with me you shared this uh, documentary this trailer for this documentary all the gold you can eat about this ormus substance and dude i have not had my mind blown by a documentary <laughs> like that in a long time because i've seen a lot of shit especially at this point but this unlocked a whole new section like i'd never <laughs> heard of this before and it's pretty fascinating and it ties into alchemy and modern alchemists and I, and ether theory, of course, but yeah, tell us a little bit about this. So I'll, I'll just go into uh, the more recent stuff, kind of where, where it was, you know, found in, in Arizona, if that's okay. Sure. So there, there's this guy named David Hudson and he was like the son of like the head of the agriculture department there or something like that. And he had like, 75,000 acres or something crazy <laughs> that he was farming. And, you know, they'd been farming it for generations. And um, it was just kind of this crappy soil, though. It had this high uh, alkaline content. It was kind of crunchy. It didn't really retain water that well. And so they had to, they had to basically go into three rotations on it in order to be able to grow their crops. And so he decided, well, I'm just going to spray the hell out of it with sulfuric acid. And so he <laughs> takes these trucks of sulfuric acid and he just starts spraying down the fields. And, you know, he's still having some issues. And so he, he's like, well, let me, you know, because he did some test fields, I think, first. And then he kind of starts doing this analysis on the soil, trying to figure out what's going on. And he, he comes up with this white powder. And... The more he looks at it, he's like, I think this is part of what my problem is, but I don't know what this is. What is this? And so he takes it around a few places and they're like, uh, I'm not sure exactly what this is. And he gets it tested at a university and they, they basically say, you know, they've got this, this really fancy equipment. It goes down like parts per billion and, um, it determines basically that he has aluminum and iron and some silica. And he's like, that's not it. That's, this isn't, this is different stuff. And then they came back and they're like, our equipment won't detect it. We don't know what it is. So he starts playing with it a little bit. And um, what, what he what he starts to realize pretty quickly is that this is not normal stuff. It does really weird things. It, if you get this powder and then you, you put it out in the sun, it, it disappears in a blinding flash of light. Hmm. It just pops. And, and gone. <laughs> and you're like, what happened? And so he started to kind of do some experiments. He talked to Hal Putoff, actually. I think he worked at SRI, didn't he? 
Um, I think so. Yeah. And so he talks to Hal Putoff, and, and, and Hal Putoff is basically telling him, well, this stuff's disappearing. Are you sure it's an explosion? Because I think he thought it was an explosion, and he's like, it might be an implosion. <laughs> so what they did was they, they put a pencil, and they stood it up on end in a little pile of this stuff, and then they, they exposed it to light, and then, poof, it goes, but the pencil's still there. Like, it didn't move. <laughs> Interesting, man. I mean, it's like it's like an ethereal extraction of some kind. This powder. It, it, well, it's like each each little grain of it's imploding on itself. So it, if it's just kind of like popping out of existence, yeah. And they're all just these little grains all doing it independently. It just adds up to a big light, but it, it won't move the pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, man! I've never seen anything like it. Now, what he finally does is he gets a hold of some Russians, and they're like, yeah, yeah, you guys don't know how to test materials over there in the West. You, you guys you just mess it all up. Let us let us tell you what to do. In Mother Russia, <laughs> you get tungsten electrodes. So he goes back. He, gets this, he pays this guy, like, I don't know, an exorbitant amount of money, a couple million dollars or something, to set up this test form custom. And Basically, what they do is they do away with the American style of electron arc spectroscopy. They remove the carbon electrodes. They put in these tungsten electrodes, and they rock and roll. They get alumina, iron, silica, and then a few minutes go by, and then they finally get osmium, iridium, platinum, gold, silver, all these different platinum group metals. And they're like, what is going on here? This isn't. Is it, if this is right, I've got like hundreds of ounces per ton, <laughs> and that's I mean that's that's unheard of in gold mining. Uh -huh. If you're if you're into that sort of range, you you are sitting pretty. Wow! If that's the concentration you're getting out of your ore, and so he, he basically realized that he had something special, and then a friend of his started to talk to him about, hey, you might want to look into. Uh, some of this stuff in the Bible here. And he's like, ah, no, I, I don't need to look at that. And he's like, well, they're talking about this white powder of gold. And he's like, what? <laughs> right, right. It comes up in the golden calf story. Yeah, that's that's what he was he was pointed to was you know this this story of of Moses coming down from the mountain. He's got the commandments in hand, and everybody's like, hey, look at a golden calf. He's like, what the hell are you guys going, getting up to while I've been up on the mountain? So what they say is he took the calf, he burned it, and then it, it turned into gold powder. And it's like, that doesn't work. You know? <laughs> and it says they ate it, too. Yeah. Well, basically, um, you know, it's, it's described in a few different cultures, and one of them is the Egyptians. And in the Egyptian culture... They called it muff god. And the thing with muff god is that it's depicted as a cone on a dish in the hieroglyphic record. And it was said to be food for the light body. So it's kind of like your, your etheric body is fed by this stuff. <laughs> wow, man, that's interesting. That kind of makes me think of Graham Hancock's latest point about the man bags. I don't know if you've seen this, but... He's been pointing out the same symbol, this bag that's in the hand of a lot of carved figures, whether it's Sumerian, Egyptian, even Mayan. You see this same bag, and he talks about it in conjunction with a cedar culture. I think the most well-known man bag picture is the Sumerian ones where they have a pine cone in the other hand. Oh, well, the pine cone, I mean, that, that's that's dead giveaway for the pineal gland. Right, of course. And so then you see this bag-like symbol in the other hand in several ancient cultures. I think Graham jokingly calls it the brotherhood of the man bag, <laughs> but it is a bit odd, and it symbolizes something. It could fit into a conversation about the pineal and the light body and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, ha I think I heard him mention that in one of his interviews, but I, I didn't really know what it was in reference to. Sure. It sounds like it could be connected. I, I'm, I have no idea, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I do know one thing, though. At the end of their lives in the Old Kingdom, the pharaohs were sent into the field of Mufkat. Hmm. And those are the those are the uh, pharaohs that that we don't have any mummies for. We we've never found their bodies. We found their tombs, but we never found their bodies. There's the idea that this may have helped them transmute themselves from a material being into a spirit being. I think that that may have some validity because there's been a lot of experiments done on the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. And basically what they've shown is that there was some sort of radiation that was given off when that image was embedded on the cloth. And it has three-dimensional information embedded in it. And the only way that it could have been put on the cloth was... They think, well, the, the only way they were able to reproduce it was by basically doing a polarized scan. So they'd scan in one direction, and then they'd scan in the other direction, you know, 90 degrees opposed to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that basically what happened was when Jesus was in the tomb, and, and he, because there's supposed to be three days where your light body hangs out around your regular body. And that's kind of supposed to be the uh, the magic grace period for you to get your shit together and get over to the other side the right way. Hmm. So basically what I think happened was he got in under the wire and he was able to transmute his body into, you know, the spirit. But in doing so, he left behind the evidence because of the Hebrew burial practices in the form of the Shroud of Turin. Hmm. And... I think that that bi-directional light was actually emitted from the pineal gland because the pineal gland, it actually has this pattern on it. There's actually kind of two different fields of, uh, of activation in terms of the, the spirals on it. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean, there, you, you can see a spiral going up around the outside long ways. Then there's kind of one that's at more of an angle. And so, I would not be surprised if, if that was how this information was embedded. Have you ever seen what DMT looks like? When you, have you ever heard of what it looks like? I've, I've taken it. I've smoked it. Well, it, it's actually these resplendent golden, I mean, not golden, um, rainbow crystals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When the guys who make it break it up, these rainbow sparks come off of it. It's like, really? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard, and I'm just like, well, there's something there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, right there, you're dealing with some sort of like piezo electric, but also psychoactive material. I mean, that's, that's pretty special. There might be some other strange properties of that stuff that, you know, might be a bit more unexpected. Mm hmm. So I, I think that it's a, it's a prime candidate for, for something like that happening there. And I mean, that fits in with the ether model and that's what I've been talking about so far. Yeah. I mean, it does connect a lot of dots. All these things are kind of quarantined from mainstream society and people might get into one or another, but it does seem like there is a relationship between many of these things that are just outside of the mainstream. And I guess I would ask, what more can you say? Do you think this is at the heart of those whispers and legends of alchemists during the Middle Ages and things like that? Oh, definitely. Yes. The Ormus, as as it's being taught to people, I, I think that's the lesser arcana, kind of, the lesser work. Right. That's the stuff where, like, okay, you can take it. You aren't going to really overdose on it. It's pretty safe, and it, it has a lot of benefits. But then there's the major arcana, the philosopher's stone, as it were. And the ormus that you see spread around on the web is, is white, the white powder. But there's also the red powder. And that's the philosopher's stone. And it could also be, from what I've heard, a, uh, a solid lump of kind of like a ruby. Right on. But that stuff is not stuff you want to toy with. <laughs> when I watched uh, All the Gold You Can Eat, they're talking to Don Nance there, and he says that when he was making some of the red lion, which is, you know, it's a form of this kind of powder, powdered gold, only they would keep it in liquid form. 
when he was making that, he gave a lady three drops of the water that was used to carry this stuff over. And he said that, that she went like, she, she basically, I mean, she didn't go crazy because this stuff was happening to her. Every negative thought that she had manifested around her. Wow. So if you thought, oh man, that cop's going to pull me over. Shit. He just runs right across the street, <laughs> backs up to you, says, give me, give me your license. <laughs> man, that is, that is hell on earth to have every thought. It's like, don't think of a pink elephant and you think of one. If you yeah. start realizing that every negative thought's going to manifest, you're going to create Armageddon real fast. Well, that's, that's <laughs> supposed to be why the alchemists kept the, the Philosopher's Stone, the great work, secret. This lady only took the water that, that was being used to distill it. I mean, it's, you know, this is, this is not the final product. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it affected her for nine months or something like that. Wow. And so for something like that, just from three drops... So that's pretty dangerous. And, and actually what, what the alchemists would do when they would actually use the Philosopher's Stone, first they had to prepare themselves mentally and, and they had to take a lot of the white stuff first because that would prepare you physically for being able to take the red. Damn. But once you actually took the red, you would get like line up a dozen glasses, a dozen glasses of wine <laughs> <laughs> and you would, you would put a, a little grain of it. They said, like, you know, the, the tip of what you could fit onto a pen. And you'd put that in one glass. And then you'd take a drop from that one. And you'd put it in the next one. And then you'd take a drop from that one. And you'd put it in the next one. Wow. And you'd do that a dozen times. To dilute it that much. And then you'd drink the last glass. Shit. <laughs> so, powerful stuff. And from what I understand, that's about the sort of amount you use for things like transmutation as well hmm. it's it's very very small amounts so what kind of what why were they taking it they felt it was the you know the way to opening the third eye expanding the crown chakra all that stuff mm -hmm. and it feeds the light body as the egyptians say it it helps you expand yourself out of yourself so to speak hmm so right in this realm, to quote something that you had said to me when we were writing back and forth, you said, alchemy, when used properly, is capable of life extension. When used improperly, is most dangerous as a vehicle for life extraction across interdimensional boundaries. And uh, that's obviously interesting. That's an, an intriguing statement. What do you think this could be used for? Because if we get into the idea that the elite know all about this, that they use this, you know, they use every tool in their toolbox. If this is something in their toolbox, how could it be used against the people? Um, I've, I've heard rumors of strobe lights being used in, in some sort of, uh, some sort of damaging fashion because they actually contain xenon gas and xenon gas is a, uh, it's an azeotrope with these ormus elements in the gas form. So in the atmosphere, there's these ormus elements in a gaseous form. It's also in the water and it's also in the earth. It's very mobile, very mobile. Hmm. <laughs> Basically what happens is with the gas form, it, it gets entrained with other things. It gets carried off. So that, that's kind of a way to think about it. Okay. Right on, man. Yeah, that's, Super fascinating because, okay, so the, the white powder that the movie's largely about, there's people who are, they're taking it orally. They're giving it to horses. Uh, they're saying that it increases vitality, energy, life extension. And then this is also, I guess, technically this is powdered gold because there's, you know, it tests positive for gold in the parts per million. So I guess this is. it's it, They call it Ormus because it's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. Gotcha. So, I mean, gold's the monoatomic element. Most of the other elements kind of bunch up in little, in little clusters. Mm -hmm. And basically, once you get into these clusters, there's actually a, a book I've got that is called Microcluster Physics, and it talks about the alkaline metals and how how they all interact in these arrangements. And when it shows pictures, and you'll actually see where. 
there's atoms being added to this little cluster, but you can't see the specific atoms. They're all kind of blended together. It's uh, it's really weird. They they kind of become a, a homogeneous mass, as it were. They're all entangled. Hmm. And they they're superconducting too. A lot of these uh, monoatomic elements are superconducting. Wow. I, I'm not sure about the base metals, but uh, I know the, the platinum group elements are superconducting, especially the gold. Hmm. If I was going to list the properties, I would say that there's there's life extension, there's uh, superconductivity, there's magical uses for it, actually, and transmutation, teleportation, and levitation. Hmm. And that actually bears into the history of alchemy and the rise of the breakaway civilization. Right. Because I believe that it was alchemists who were developing this stuff late in the 19th century, the middle to late 19th century, who actually created the foundations and the roots of the breakaway civilization. Yeah, I totally see that. I think that makes perfect sense, and you're probably onto something there. So, man, I guess, obviously, you're not selling a book today. I mean, is there anything you'd want to plug or any contact info you'd want to give out? Should people just find you on those plus forums? Well, you know, I, I wish I wish this could come out tonight because there is the Wilhelm Reich documentary. And I would have loved to have plugged it before today, but it tomorrow I think uh no wait, there's three days left, but you're still not gonna probably get it out in time. Nah. But yeah, that that was an Indiegogo um uh thing and and it's it's got some support. So far, it's raised nearly $300,000 to make a, uh, a factual documentary about Wilhelm Reich. Damn. It's also supported by the guy who wrote uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, Biologist. Damn. And that, and that is uh, James E. Strick, Ph.D., and it's from the Harvard Press. So, but it's supposed to be, I mean, this guy went to, I think, like four or five different countries maybe three or four different countries. Uh, but he, he went all around the world trying to find information about Wilhelm Reich. He, he visited Oregon. He visited Norway, Germany. Um, and he, he, he w- went through everything he could find, all available information, even Reich's FBI file. And he put this documentary together from it. And I think that it's something that really, really deserves support. He didn't get enough, um, he was looking for 180,000 in this round of financing, but he only got about 106,000 so far. So, um, I'm sure he's going to probably do another round of financing and it'd be really great if he could help with that. Right on. Something to keep an eye on. Yeah. That's being headed by Kevin Hinchy and it's the Wilhelm Reich documentary film project edit phase. Cool. Hopefully it comes to fruition, but man, Shaman Janeer. I do appreciate you reaching out, man. I think this has connected quite a few dots. My mind is thoroughly blown, so great job on that. (laughs) I guess take care of yourself, and I'm sure we'll do this again sometime. Sounds great. Let me know. All right, man. Okay. Peace. Bye. All right, all right. Last day of the month at the zero hour, sliding another episode into that roster. And I love this one. I think these secret science shows are some of my favorite. Guests like Wal Thornhill and Eric Dollard and Brooks Agnew. This one, I think, was firmly in that vein. And I've been thinking about this information for the past couple of weeks and looking into it. And I think a little ether theory, a little electric universe. And this is where I think a lot of the secrets are. I'm pretty convinced. I know we mentioned the Mandela effect, but I can't remember which hour it was in. And I know a lot of people have wanted to see that pop up on THC. So that's good. But obviously, I think people would like to see a full show on it or something more in depth. But large chunks of people have memories that are just slightly different than reality. That's kind of the crux of this whole effect. Some people think it's proof of timeline switching or dimensional jumping, but it could also be just people remembering shit wrong. The most compelling and most famous example is those books that we had when we were kids called the Berenstein Bear books. You remember Berenstein Bears? Well, funny enough, the real name is Berenstain Bears, but barely anybody remembers it that way. I know I didn't. 
and they call this thing the Mandela effect because though Nelson Mandela died a few years ago, many people remember him dying a few years even earlier than that when he was still in prison. But honestly, these things happen. Everybody knows the famous line, Luke, I am your father, right? Well, that line is actually never said in the movie. The real line when Luke says, Uncle Ben said that you killed my father, Vader says, no, I am your father. But nobody remembers it that way. And I think in this case, the reason is because when other movies and media want to make references to that scene, no, I am your father isn't descriptive enough. So it became Luke, I am your father. And then people just remember it that way, thinking that that's the way it was in the movie, but it's not the real line. So I don't know. Maybe CERN is jumping timelines to get narratives the way they want them, and Berenstein became Berenstain as a side effect. Or maybe memory isn't as concrete as we want to believe. But leave it to humans to say, no, I couldn't possibly be wrong about something. The entire universe obviously must have changed. I'm messing around, but it is an interesting kind of effect and worth looking into because there's so many cases. However, fun show, I thought. I feel confident that uh, Shaman Engineer made a solid case for Ether Theory, and he did a great job for a first interview. Not that THC is really a hard show to deal with, but two hours is a long time, and I thought he did great. I think we'll probably do it again, unless the feedback I get is way off from what I expect. Of course, there will be comments about shutting it off 10 minutes in because he thinks the Earth is a ball, and so you, quote, heard all you needed to hear, but I try not to let that affect me too much. I try to think back to 90s television and standards and practices when a late night host might say something that causes dozens of angry Christians to write a letter and then the network freaks out that 0.0001% of the audience didn't like something when they forget that millions of people saw it and apparently didn't have a problem. But nobody writes a letter to NBC saying how they weren't offended by last night's show. I think something's going on similarly with the Flat Earth people. And a small, loud segment of an audience can seem much bigger when they're all so vocal. But I've said it before. The Flat Earth has some really compelling points. I think uh, the show with Eric Dubay brought out most of those things. But I'm not convinced because I... I'm going to say it. I think space exists. I'm a space theorist. I hate to be so controversial, but I got to say it. However, Ormus and alchemy, man, fascinating stuff, right? Alchemy doesn't seem possible until you really consider ether theory heavily. And if spirits or entities can pop into our reality from somewhere else, why can't alchemical materials? My simple stoner college dropout excuse for a brain thinks that there might be some type of connection there. You could say this realm is kind of the science of magic. Obviously, it's a bit over my head, but... I feel like it connects a lot of dots, and I want to find more guests on this sort of topic now, for sure. As for the Plus Show, we got into another fascinating saga that hasn't been mentioned on THC, but I almost had the author of this book, Secrets of Delshaw, on. His name's Dennis Crenshaw, but we lost touch because he's pretty much off the grid. And then synchronistically, my next guest, Shaman Janir, brings up the Sonora Aero Club, which is what that book is about, and this very same secret society of airship flyers and borderline alchemists may be the earliest inclinations of a type of breakaway civilization using these texts. It is great stuff, super interesting. We talk about other fascinating stuff in the Plus Show, and Shimonjanir adds some logs to the Stephen Hawking human puppet fire that I had mentioned a few weeks ago. But now I'm pretty convinced that they are using a different guy entirely. Miles Mathis has worked on this, and a lot of people sent me his work. I'm going to try to get him on, but he makes a pretty strong case. The bone structure looks like it changed somewhere in the late 80s. But man, so much packed in here today. I hope you liked it. I'm going to get out of here, but if you enjoyed this episode, sign up for Plus, and if you already have, then get on the forums and get deep with Shaman Janir. He's on there trying to start conversations, screaming into the abyss. Maybe now some responses will pop up. I'm sure we can get a conversation going around these subjects, so 
join that party, and I'll see you next time. That's it for me, your move sorcerers of Sonora, keepers of secret sciences, and alchemical quarantiners. Your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes And then realized it was dark outside it was a light coming down from the sky I don't know who or why Must be those strangers that come every night Whose saucer-shaped light put people up tight Blue-green footprints that glow in the dark I hope they get home all right Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please take me along I won't do anything wrong you please take me along the high side? Woke up this morning, I was feeling quite weird. I had flies in my beard, my toothpaste was smeared. I opened my window. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular, 
Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the Plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too. I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon, but I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out, totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself.